Thank you, Susanna, for the kind introduction, and thanks to Paul for inviting me to speak. Uh, I just need to get my slides up. <clears throat> Hopefully, I can shut that. Is that right? All right, so I am going to start the timer. Um, I'm going to uh, try to schedule things so we can still finish on time but have a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to condense a little bit. Uh, I'm going to focus really on um, kind of trying to give you an introduction to FIT, but also uh, talk more about the role of OPEN within our project uh, and how that's worked. Um, so just uh, to get a sense from you, how many of you had heard of or seen FET um, before coming to the conference? Um, have you, how many have actually played with the FET simulation? Uh, it's less than half. How many of you have disseminated or used FET within your work in open education? All right, well, I am here to try to change that. Um, okay, so, uh, so this brief outline, what is, the, what is FET? Uh, and then um, focusing in on what is the role of open licensing uh, and its impact within our project. And I'm going to leave with a, just a couple challenges and opportunities that our project's working on. Uh, so FET was founded way back when open started in 2002 by Carl Wyman. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001, and he used simulations as a way to explain his uh, complicated science to general audiences, and he just found this tool incredibly powerful for making these complex ideas accessible to broad audiences. And he saw that through the um, sort of complexity of the questions that they were asking back. It was, it was indicative of the fact that they were understanding the fundamental ideas that were um, a part of his work. Uh, so he founded FET uh, with the goals of making STEM learning more engaging, so making it more interactive, letting students really uh, engage and um, explore and discover the key ideas through interaction, to making uh, science more relevant to these students, to a broader range of students, to showing them how uh, science really was explaining the world around them and how they could use science and math in their everyday lives, making it more accessible on um, both just the broad access, getting tools to where tools are needed, but more generally to make um, it more accessible by making it more intuitive and understandable through, through the tool that you're using to explain that science. Um, making it more effective, lots of science is taught without even students engaging in science practices, so integrating that into the process of learning science. Uh, and also to develop a deeper conceptual understanding. A lot of research in physics education has shown that students um, at all levels uh, can, can take a, a physics class or a science class and leave without developing a conceptual understanding of, of the underlying ideas. And to make uh, it more personalized, where students have a lot more agency over how they're learning uh, and understanding science. Um, so focusing in, and just to um, really emphasize this point, is to a goal to make science learning more active. So science is an active process. We're engaged, our curiosity is engaged in understanding the world around us. Um, we engage in uh, experimentation, collecting data, modeling that data, gathering evidence, giving our reasonings. Um, you know, it's really active, and so often science learning isn't taught in that way, and to integrate that into the whole system. And to do that through uh, the use of interactive simulations. So we are situated at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, in the physics department uh, here in this big tower with these nice mountains behind us. Uh, just sort of like we have mountains here. Um, we have two sides of our project. We really have a product development side where we're trying to generate high quality OER and put it out to the world. Uh, we also engage in research, so we sit within a physics education research group in the physics department, uh, and we engage in um, research around simulation design. How do students engage in learning from a simulation? And also, 
how you can integrate simulations into the classroom and how that changes the learning dynamic between students, between students and teachers, and between everything and the, and the content that's being learned. Uh, today we have a, over 150, I think it's 157 simulations, 82 in HTML5 for those, um, it's really important, but not everybody understands why. Uh, 2,000 um, simulation-based lessons. We cover physics, That's, that was our home, that was where we started. We expanded chemistry, math, or science, biology. Uh, they're used in K-12 and college, um, say middle school, high school, and introductory college are, are um, leading categories of use. Uh, they are an OER. They're licensed under the CCB license. They're translated into over 90 languages. And they can run online or offline. So one of our access solutions is to provide um, an installer for our entire website. So you can download a single simulation and port that around on a thumb drive. Or you can download a full installer of the entire website and bring that to your unconnected school and install it on computers. Um, and then you have all the simulations that were available at that time that you downloaded the installer. Uh, so this is our growth over the years. Right now we're at about 120 million runs per year. Uh, we've delivered 650 simulations um, total. Uh, but plus offline use. So this offline use is impossible for me to tell you how much that could be. I think it could double this number, but I can't tell you exactly because um, we have no data on that. Uh, so um, this is what our content expansions looked like over the years. Uh, we started in kind of introductory physics and then we expanded to quantum physics in 2005, chemistry in 2008. Middle school science in 2010, where we did a lot of learning about how simulations can be designed for younger students, and we've now integrated that across our simulations. Uh, we expanded to math in 2012, and then uh, to sort of focused in on algebraic thinking in 2015. And I am trying to raise money to focus on K-1 math, because I think that is so um, influential. I want to do that. Uh, Technology advancement, we um, first built the simulations in English, and then in 2004, pretty early on, we made them translatable into Spanish in a very rudimentary way. Uh, and then we made the simulations translatable, so anybody could translate them into any language. Then we made the website translatable, um, a bigger task, but still doable. Uh, we, um, we completed our first simulation in HTML5 in 2013. And the reason that's notable is because we started when Java and Flash were the technology of simulations, and now they are incredibly hard to run. Flash is um, sunsetting at the end of 2020, and, uh, and Java is just a technically challenging thing to run these days. Uh, so we're working on moving everything to HTML5, but it is a very resource-intensive process. Um, but we're leveraging every opportunity uh, that comes along with having to do, redo all that work. Uh, and we, um, as part of that, uh, was the ability to sort of actually face head-on the challenge of how you make things that are so visual accessible to students who are non-visual, how to make them screen readable accessible, how to do um, you know, the descriptive, uh, interactive descriptive text that allows, uh, allows um, non-visual students to fully engage in a simulation. And we released our first accessible sim in 2017. We are still working on that um, technology challenge, but it is uh, fun and exciting. Um, so uh, this is what our global use looks like. It's 33% uh, international, uh, essentially used in every country or territory. Um, this is, I, I kind of plotted this minus the US because the US just dominates otherwise. Um, these are our uh, top 15 minus the US countries that are using the simulations online. This is just, I can only get Google Analytics. Um, <clears throat> So I am going to show you some simulations now. So since many of you haven't seen them. So they're built as these open exploratory play spaces that are, they don't come up with directions. You're just, um, 
you know, you just start engaging with them. Uh, buckets uh, tend to be a very um, attractive thing for students to start with. <laughs> um, so they don't really have trouble starting with that. You can see I'm pulling in protons, neutrons, electrons. Uh, every time I pull in a proton, you see the element name change. Every time I pull in a neutron, you'll see the mass number change. And every time I pull an electron, you'll see the charge change. And, and students can easily engage with this in an inquiry-based way to discover the basic rules about atoms, things that you would normally have to have told them just how atoms work before. Now we can provide them with this interactive and much more engaging environment to learn about these fundamentals. Um, uh, this, this screen layers up to this idea of how chemists capture this information in the chemical symbol here. And there's a game for students to test their understanding. Sometimes students will jump straight to the game and they'll realize, huh, I don't understand this. Uh, but then they always have access to the um, explore screen to go back and see, um, you know, what's going on there. So <clears throat> that is uh, one of our simulations. I'm going to show you a range because um, because uh, we have some different styles. This next one is called Circuit Construction Kit, and it really is a kit. It's more like building blocks, and you can build whatever you want uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, so here you pull out wires, light, light bulbs, and batteries. Um, as soon as you connect them, you see the electrons flow, so you get immediate feedback that that's working. Um, you can do things like change the battery voltage. Uh, that's what more like an undergrad might do. I, an elementary student might just grab another battery and see what happens there. Um, so there's multiple ways to interact with these things. And if I flip this battery, for instance, um, well, that w was at 9 volts. Uh, if you keep, keep them at the default, then what you see is essentially that you've, you've canceled out all of your voltage, so you don't have anything left. Um, you can pull out voltmeters, so you can really use this tool to engage in a whole range of learning from um, sort of the basics about electric circuits to getting at the college level about parallel and series circuits, taking a set of um, data. You can even here um, change the resistance of the light bulb. So you can do things that are just not possible in the real world um, to develop your understanding. Uh, <clears throat> within math, uh, we have arranged one of my Kind of favorite ones that we did earlier on is this one about fractions. Um, and again, it's just, uh, just gives students a way to um, engage in discovering, you know, what does that top number do? What does the bottom number do? Um, they can uh, play with the numbers. They can play with the pieces. They can rearrange the pieces. They can look at different representations, including cake. Um, they can play with the number line, so it integrates all the way to the number line, and again, if you change the denominator, you'll see that show up uh, on your number line. Uh, there's a game where students can um, practice building fractions if they, uh, if they get it wrong. It just pops back out. They can try again. Um, and they can build it however they want. So there I put the two-fourths, I put a half in two-fourths because it is a half, um, and here I do the opposite. So it, 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 it's really flexible. Um, there's an open lab for, student, for teachers to now discuss, you know, okay, um, Sammy, come up and build a one half. Now can somebody else come up and build a one half in a different way? Um, and so then the they, teacher can facilitate um, a lot of discussion around how uh, multiple ways to build a one half and how that works. Okay, and this one is um, gravity and orbits and you can change forces and watch your planet crash into the sun and things like that. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> keeping an eye on time. Uh, so, within our project, we really do focus on a research-based design cycle around building these simulations. So we start with the learning goals and with the research base. So, the research base around how people learn um, and everything that goes along with that. Uh, the research base around simulation design, but also specifically the research base around student difficulties within a particular content space. So with um, circuits, one of the student difficulties is, um, do I still have it up? One of the student difficulties is that current is used up. 
And in, uh, and in this simulation, what you can see is that, uh, you know, current is not used up here. It, there is the same, the electrons are going the same speed here as here. And if I pull out my current meter, I can actually measure that with my current meter. So we specifically look at the student difficulties around particular content spaces and, and build that in to um, how, the, how the simulation um, is designed. And then we also engage in interviews for every simulation. So we bring students in, we watch them use the simulation, we look at the flow, we look at their interpretation of the representations. Uh, we make sure that they are leaning into the simulation, asking their own questions, engaged, and, um, and making progress towards the learning goals that we've identified for the simulations. Each one, uh, we have a team of about four to five experts, so those are experts in uh, teaching the content, experts in the content itself, uh, experts in simulation design, and uh, experts, uh, um, software developers. Uh, each one takes about 200 hours of design and 600 hours of development, uh, plus student interviews and quality assurance testing. So these are not, um, these are not things you can, it's hard to do this level of simulation on the weekends. Um, so uh, one key idea is this idea of implicit scaffolding. So you saw there's no like directives in there about touch this, touch that. Um, so we call that implicit scaffolding. We scaffold through the design by how we place the controls, um, what dynamic feedback we provide as students interact. Uh, we build in the real world connections. Um, we show the models that scientists use, so there's lots of simulations that will show vector models and, and things like that, that scientists use to actually develop their own understanding. We show the invisible, so we show electrons, atoms, um, photons. Uh, and we do allow these actions that aren't possible because lots of times they will help students develop their understanding. So being able to dynamically change that resistance of the light bulb, you can swap a resistance out in the, in the lab, but that dynamic um, ability to change and see what happens immediately helps build that cause and effect relationship that we're trying to um, help students uh, develop. All right, so the result is a simulation, um, a tool that can support multiple learning goals all at once. So it can support students' content development, their concepts, uh, their models, their understanding of representations and relationships. But it also um, can support their engagement in science processes and practices. So exploring and questioning and, and um, predicting what's going to happen when something changes. Uh, when you embed it into a learning, um, uh, a learning environment, it can also support students' ability to engage in argumentation and collaboration, uh, support their development of lab techniques, and um, and one of our main goals is to support their enjoyment of learning science uh, and to not leave class with saying things like, I'm not a science person. That everybody can, can be a science person and to develop their ability and their identity as a scientist. Um, so we encourage a lot of student agency in the implementation of the simulations. So, uh, <clears throat> So basically, we try to develop these high-quality tools that also have high flexibility. So you can use them in lecture. Um, you can use them in lecture tutorial or small class discussion. Um, here, this is a university classroom. Happens a lot at the, at the K-12 level, too. You can use them in lab. You can use them um, as an outside of uh, kind of class time thing, as a pre-lab, a pre-class assignment, a homework. You can. Um, basically use them with any kind of pedagogy uh, and any kind of um, you know, it, learning environment, whether you're online or offline. You do need to be able to run them. That is the one requirement. But you could be a completely traditional instructor, and we see lots of them using the simulations as a demo, because the simulations are just like they think in their mind, so they really are attracted to them. Um, and then we see a lot of people in using the simulations to engage in much more reformed uh, classroom practices. So now I want to engage you in uh, experiencing it a little bit. Um, if I can type. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to pull up a simulation called curve fitting. And I'm going to keep an eye on the time. I think we have time to do this. Uh, so here you can pull out um, data, data points. Uh, and these data points are kind of special. You can change their error bars. Hmm, fancy. Uh, and you can plot a best fit curve. So uh, I'm going to pose this question to you. How many have engaged in sort of concept tests or peer discussion ever? Oh, nobody. Not very many people. OK, this is awesome. So in, in lecture in college, we use this a lot to make lecture more interactive. Um, and it's good for you guys to wake up, so I'm going to do it. Um, so, uh, so the way this works is I pose a question. And then you're going to turn to your peer, your neighbor. You're going to discuss that question and reason with each other and try to, try to come up with um, your best uh, collective answer. And then I'm going to ask you to vote. And here I've just um, given the responses a one or two or three. So I'm going to ask you to vote like this, like a one, two, or three. So nobody else has to see how you vote, really. Just, just me. Uh, if I was in a classroom, I'd have clickers or a colored car. So, um, so here's the graph I just made. So if we increase the error bar on this one data point, um, what's going to happen to the slope of the best fit line? So this is the best fit line. Is it going to become more negative? So is it going to tilt um, clockwise like this? Uh, or is it going to become less negative? Is it going to tip up like this? Or is it not going to change? Um, OK, so now is your turn to, to turn to your neighbor and think about this. So go ahead. Okay, see, look, this is awesome. This is what I love. If I was actually teaching a class in college, I would um, walk around and, and listen in on the conversation so I would get some pre-knowledge about what the students were thinking um, before I asked for votes, but uh, and some insights into to what votes meant. Um, but uh, but uh, I, I don't have that much time. So, uh, so let's go ahead and vote. So, uh, um, OK, on the count of three, you're going to hold up a one or two or three just in front of your body. So, OK, one, two, three. OK, not everybody's voting. Everybody should be holding a one or two or a three, like what your answer is. You're, you're voting your answer. Like, do you think it's answer one, answer two, or answer three? OK, so it's a totally split vote. <laughs> I'm seeing ones, I'm seeing twos, and I'm seeing threes. And, and that's not unusual um, at all. Uh, because it's not, it's not that intuitive. But you've had to discuss it. You've had to, you've had to think about it. You've had to reason about you know, what is going on here. So now we're going to do the experiment, and we're actually going to change this, and you're all going to see what happens. Ready? Zoop. <laughs> so. So now you're more vested in why did that happen, right? 
so some people, um, so the reason why it happened is because uh, these error bars um, tell me something about how uncertain this point is. If it's really big error bars, that means that data is, excuse my language, uh, crap. Uh, so, so if you have data that's not very good, you should just not count it very much. Uh, so uh, it's kind of like throwing that point away if you make the data, um, uh, the, da the error bar is really big. And if you make them really small, it's going like, to count more, much more and tip it up. So, uh, but, you know, there's other intuitions that you might have had, like, oh, if it's really big, the line should definitely go through it, so it's going to shift up. Or the line shouldn't care about it because the, the central data points aren't changing at all. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that student can reason there, and so you could have a, an interactive discussion. Uh, but that was fun. Okay, so you did engage in... <laughs> Sorry, my time got shrunk, so here I am. Uh, so uh, you did engage in science practices, and I'll let you um, to think about reflecting on what those were while you were doing that. Um, this is what it can look at, like in a smaller classroom. So uh, this is a, stu a teacher introducing fractions. What? Uh, so I thought I had till 10.30. I have a timer. I'm, I'm good. I, I'm sad I'm not, I'm on this. Hey, change the conversation to what the bottom number teaches them. Well, the bottom number is the bottom number. The bottom number is the bottom number. The So uh, that is just to show you that, you know, the same thing happens with little kids too. Like, you, you show them a sim and, and you give them a prompt not telling them what to do with the sim. What does the bottom number do in that fraction sim I showed you? And they will start talking about it. So uh, it can really impact learning. So um, we did a study uh, in learning fractions for fourth graders. This was knowledge that they should have learned in third grade. Uh, in the pretest, they came in, they knew the procedural knowledge of fractions pretty well, but they had, they were not doing so good on the conceptual ideas within fractions. And after, um, uh, you know, sort of a three-day working session, like three consecutive classes working with the simulation and retesting, they really increase that conceptual knowledge and reinforce their procedural knowledge. Uh, the same thing happens in college class, so uh, we had a classic demo around standing waves and then we used our wave on a string sim to, to um, demo it instead, and in this case the sim gave a dramatic improvement in students' ability to visualize what a standing wave and was and how things were moving. Um, so moving to the role of open. So um, we build these simulations, as I explained, they're, they're really highly designed. So we actually emphasize four of the five R's within the simulation itself, retain, reuse, revise in parentheses, remix, and redistribute. So math and science are this universal language. So generally, this, you see the same student difficulties all around the world, no matter who the students are. Um, so, uh, so um, and the tools are so highly designed that we do not make it that easy to revise. The source code is open, and some people do grab the source code, but then it's impossible to maintain because, um, you know, Apple and everybody changes things. So we don't encourage changing the source code that much. Uh, but we do make it really easy to access and to adapt. So um, we make it embeddable and downloadable. We don't require internet. It's easy to reuse. We can add the, in the language. Um, we also let you uh, kind of e use a query parameter to select just one screen so you can better um, structure the lessons. Uh, what we do um, encourage is adapting um, SIM-based learning environments. So the SIM is not the only thing. It's just this open tool. Uh, you build some activity or task around it. You have teacher facilitation. It's all occurring in a context. And that makes it incredibly um, reusable and powerful to uh, localize into various contexts. Um, so uh, you have your teacher and your student um, with your simulation plus activity. This can be, you know, what you do exactly will vary with the grade level, the prior knowledge of the students, the, their cultural experiences, the teacher's learning goals, their pedagogical approach, their content knowledge, 
um, and their pedagogical content knowledge. Uh, you're surrounding that by the learning context. Are you in school? Are you in a museum? Are you homeschooling? Are you doing an after school program? You know, what is the setting that you're choosing to use the simulation in? Is it a large lecture? Are you doing small group discussions? Online um, courses, textbooks, um, video tutorials, they can use in any of these contexts. Um, it also will depend on the tech resources you have. So do you just have one projector? Do you have one-to-one um, -one devices? Uh, are you in a fully online environment? Do you have other experimental equipment you're trying to work with or math manipulatables? You know, what do you have available to you? Um, it also depends on what country and community and culture you're in. So what language, what national standards, um, you know, uh, what's your environment or your community and how does that influence what you do? So we build an open ecosystem around the simulations to translate a simulation um, we have a lesson exchange database where we encourage teachers to share their lessons and search for lessons as um, usable spaces, usable um, starting points, and all of those are shared as CCBY. So on, our, on any simulation web page, you'll find um, the submitted activities, uh, and you can also submit your own activities. Um, we also partner with other open education products, projects um, as part of our remix and re redistribution partnerships. So OER Commons, OpenStax uses the simulations in their work. Um, learning Equality and Calibri brings it to um, offline communities. Hippocampus in integrates it. Um, GoLab is a project in the Netherlands that, that uses it. And uh, Silvia, yeah, I can never pronounce that, uh, uses it in the, their textbooks. Um, so this is what it looks like around the world, this Burundi, um, Indonesia, Cambodia, Mexico, Nigeria, Vietnam. So you see uh, just like a huge range of what was available there. Um, uh, but for the most part, students were using the simulation. So that's really exciting when you see this. This is something that really excites me. So uh, we are seeing increasing local research on FET simulation. So I just do like every now and then I do a Google scholar search of FET simulation education to sort of get the right context. Um, I don't look at every one of these links because there's too many and some of them are in other languages and I can't understand it. But, uh, but you can see that, you know, back here, this was pretty much just us doing research. But now, you know, there's more than like um, 700 links on Google Scholar that have FET simulations in the in the link, and these are real papers, and I'm just like, oh my God, there's so many people doing stuff. So in 2019 in South Africa, there were some researchers looking at the student impacts um, on attitudes towards learning chemistry in the third year Bachelor of Education students. So um, they found uh, basically significantly higher mean post-attitude test scores and that the students like experience autonomy and enjoyment with, with the simulations. In Zambia, they looked at the impact on E&M learning for sixth grade or 11th grade students and saw a positive impact in performance and attitudes. In Thailand, they looked at, um, now pedagogically, they looked at integrating simulations with formative assessment. Uh, it was in the context of buoyancy. Um, and they found a positive impact of uh, the integration of formative assessment pedagogy with the simulations on the learning outcomes. Uh, in Indonesia, they looked at um, FET simulations and its ability to enhance critical thinking skills in the work energy context. Small study, lots of these are kind of small studies. Um, uh, I looked for one in Italy, because that's where we are. Um, so uh, in Italy, there was this one uh, conference proceedings, I think, um, yeah, conference proceedings, looking at um, the ordering of real, using real stuff versus virtual stuff, or virtual versus real, and how that, that worked, um, which ordering was better for, uh, this is a grade school study for electrostatic attraction. Uh, uh, when I looked at the graph, and their conclusion was that the, that the ordering didn't matter in the final understanding, but it did impact sort of when students got that understanding, uh, the simulation, they got it faster. Um, uh, there was one in Lebanon about virtual versus phys physical experimentation around circuits. Um, <clears throat> anyway, that, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's crazy. Uh, and it's really exciting to see. Um, so our challenges and opportunities. So, 
Uh, we do have a really large effort right now um, around accessibility and inclusive design, and that's led by my colleague, Emily Moore. Um, and uh, it's been go work going on for a few, new few years now. You can find out a lot more about it at this link on our website, Accessibility. But this simulation is fully accessible, screen reader compatible on our website right now. Uh, there's a lot of technical challenges around that. We had to build a technical solution and um, as well as pedagogical solutions to try to create the same sort of inquiry-based experience that you can have with a regular sim um, and do that through screen readers. Um, uh, and it actually uses the same tool. It's not a different tool, it's the same tool. It's just the tool that can do both things. Um, uh, another challenge is sustainability. So we have been working on building a business model, a sustainable mission-driven business model is how I call it. Uh, so we have various threads that we're trying to do that, but that is, um, it's certainly a challenge. Uh, I don't have the right answer. Um, but we do have a lot of business partners now. <laughs> um, they don't pay all that much, but, uh, but, uh, but it is mission-driven. So. Um, Every time a simulation is in one of their products, it's benefiting the students that are accessing their products. Like if their school is still using a Pearson product, well, at least now they can use a simulation that's good with that Pearson product. Um, so uh, right now, we're, it, we're at about 20% of the budget um, it, through our business model. Uh, so we still have to really thank our funders because they keep us in business. <laughs> Um, and we're really grateful to the community that helps support us. Uh, this is the team. Um, you know, I'm up here representing us, but, uh, but they're really um, a talented group of folks that are very passionate about this work um, and, and thankful for the award that we got this year. Uh, so you can find FET online. You can contribute lessons. You can disseminate it. Um, if you're interested in partnering in some way, that's my email, and you can connect to us on Twitter or Facebook. So thank you. Thank and you I very much, Katie. I, I can that. witness that uh, when we have a workshop about open educational resources, uh, our teachers are usually not aware about, uh, about repository except FET. FET is always uh, very well known by our teachers. So, there is a question somebody, somewhere? Please. Uh, before that? Okay. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm uh, really glad to see FET uh, being here because I've been uh, using FET since, I think, 2014 when I was uh, uh, giving a chemistry and physics course to first-year bachelor students. And basically, the physics students need to come up to speed on, uh, on their chemistry, and the chemistry students needed to get up to speed on their physics. And it was an incredible pain to, uh, to teach all of them at once in the same classroom. And these simulations really, really helped with that um, to give them some, uh, some feeling of uh, independence in, in, in their own learning process. Um, so, that's, so first of all, thank you then for that. <laughs> uh, the second thing, uh, what I was wondering, you, you were saying that the transition from Java to HTML5 is quite uh, labor intensive, right? So I was wondering, now that FET is really becoming big and a lot of people are using it, is, is, and, and it's uh, open source, is this something you can ask of the, of the community? Like, um, please contribute by helping us transition into a more modern digital uh, environment. Is, would, would that be a, a consideration for you? So, um, I... So we, we have been kind of um, having volunteers come in to, to help us uh, with some of that transition. But it, it takes a while. Like, so FED is built on its own code base. Um, it's HTML5, but it's, it's, it's not just sort of vanilla HTML. It's its own code base, and it has its own structure. And so um, you know, I, I'd be interested in exploring it, but right now we do 
kind of experience that it takes about a year for a developer to get up to really get up to speed. And that's a developer working sort of full time on the project. So I don't know how um, I, I don't know how we'd be able to sort of restructure that so that it could be sort of the more of the open source community where people are taking on little problems at once. Um, Yeah, I'm happy to, if anybody has questions, you can come up, and I'm happy to stick around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, when I first started in OER, FET is one of the first things that I actually came across. Um, I had two very quick questions. One, um, is there a sort of um, a feedback mechanism beyond, like, sending an email, oh, this is kind of funky, or, oh, hey, could you maybe do this a little bit differently? And then also, um, you mentioned that you were having the HTML5 thing. Have you noticed that the um, converted uh, HTML5 iterations are concentrated in any particular category or subject, or are they kind of spread out across the entire sort of catalog? Uh, so um, email is really the best. We do read our email, and like if there's a user suggestion, we'll make a ticket around that within the repository of the simulation, so that, that that's really the we don't get so many emails that we don't read them. We read them. I don't read them, but we read them. Um, uh, it's really a funding issue. So, um, so we are trying to convert our most popular simulations first. So we're kind of going by popularity more than by content space. Um, you'll see a lot of the math are in HTML5 because they were actually funded after we converted. So. Um, it, it's also the oldest ones that are suffering the most because, um, because they're all in Java and Flash and anything new is in HTML5. Uh, so it's, it's, if people have ideas of, of funders that might want to help, it's really kind of the most challenging piece of raising money is to get people to um, redo software. <laughs>